Howdy. My name is Nick. And I'm a pastor of youth and family ministry here at Faith. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for worship online. Whether you're using the live stream and worshiping with us on Sunday morning, or maybe you're watching in the replays throughout the week, or maybe you're on YouTube and you're, you're listening and watching one of our messages. Thank you for being the church. Thank you for being connected here at Faith. And I, I would just like to encourage you that if you feel moved by this act of worship, that you consider engaging with us more, sharing your thoughts during the live stream in the chat, or reaching out to us through our many social media platforms that we are a part of. We are the church together, and we are so much better together than we could ever be apart. So let's, let's build these relationships that matter. So as you enjoy this time of meaningful worship, I just want to extend that special welcome to those who are new with us and let you know that here at Faith, Everyone belongs, and relationships truly matter. Good morning, church. So today is a very proud dad moment for me as uh, we get to baptize my daughter, Emerson Rose. And so the baptism was no secret to the congregation. You know, about four weeks ago or so, the, uh, some folks from the choir were coming up to me after the first service and asking about it. And you know if the choir knows, everyone knows. But no, they've been asking me and saying since, you know, Pastor Rusty is going to do the baptism, that means I would be up here to preach. And so they were saying, I should preach on the theme of baptism, right? Or I should, I should look for scripture that has water in it. And I should preach about that, the water of life. And so I listened to y'all. And you know where I went with it? The book of Revelation. <laughs> Buckle up. Okay, you get more than you bargained for today, all right? And how I want to start this this morning is, is by asking y'all a question. So, so maybe, um, have you ever wanted to give somebody, like, just a really special gift? Like, you just really wanted to bless this person, and so you, you, like, actually read the Amazon reviews. You don't just look at the star count in the corner. Like, you're reading the reviews. You really want to get this person just a really special gift. And you spend all this time, all this energy, and you give them the gift, and the person's just kind of like, eh. They just don't really, they didn't really care. They, they thought, eh kind of indifferent about it? Well, boy, do I have a story for you. So when Morgan and I first got married, uh, I like to think that I'm somewhat of a good gift giver, okay? And Morgan doesn't like this about me. So she wanted to get me a really great birthday gift. And she knew I was training for an Ironman. That's one of those really long endurance sports, right? And so she took all this time, all this energy, and she got me a subscription to an Ironman or a triathlon magazine subscription. And when she presented it to me, she was so excited. She gave it to me early before my birthday. And I looked at it, and I just went, eh. She was like, what do you mean? I just spent all of this energy. This is what you're doing. This is what you're training for. Here's the thing about me. I like to ball on a budget, okay? And so all those things in this magazine, I just thought, well, I can just Google that. Right? Like, I can just look that up. That's okay. But see, here, here's the real thing. Being married to Morgan and getting to spend the rest of my life with her is really the greatest gift she could ever give me. Yeah. Somebody at the first service told me I should say that at this service. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, have, have you ever had that experience maybe in your life with gift giving? The way I'd like you all to frame it now, then, is I'd like you to think about it from the perspective of Jesus. How do we think Jesus feels when he looks at his church today? Our God is the giver of every good gift. We truly are blessed daily. We are blessed with his living word. We are given the gift of direct communication with our God. 
Bruce Almighty, that's the way uh, you get to email God, right? Direct communication with God. Our God gives us purpose. Our God gives us mission and calling. And yet we can go day in and day out without ever thinking about him. Today I'd like to talk about the topic of spiritual indifference. So how are you doing spiritually? (laughs) This theme came from a podcast I was listening to. So part of my continuing education, I like to uh, listen to leadership podcasts or leadership podcasts about the church. Uh, As a a mentor of mine once said, it's it's free chicken, right? You get to to learn for free. And so in this podcast, uh, they're talking about why haven't people returned to church post-pandemic? And they said the main reason for this is indifference. And they they talked about it as if this is some kind of new theme or something that we're seeing. But really, spiritual indifference has been a part or a problem in the church since its very beginning. And so today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at two examples that Jesus gives us about spiritual indifference and how together we can be able to overcome this problem in our lives. And, and, and look, y'all, this, this message isn't, this isn't like me shaming you into coming to church or trying to bully you to come to church. It's not going to work, okay? That's, that's not the point. The point is, how can we, how can we overcome this problem together? Because if you think about it, the podcast was right in some ways. Out of, out of the pandemic, you know, we saw concerts return to full attendance. We saw sporting events rise back to full attendance. Even the movie theaters, right? People are going to movies now more than ever. But yet, people still aren't coming back, either in person or online, to worship. And so, spiritual indifference is actually a real problem that we face today. And it's one that I've even faced. As I think about it in my own life, for me, when I first went off to college, I I went to school about three hours away from home, so three hours away from my home church. And I got to college, and I stopped going to church. I stopped going to church for quite some time. And we'll unpack that a little bit more. So our reading today comes from the book of Revelation. Anyone else's favorite book in the Bible, Revelation? Isn't that the fun one? Right? Okay, so here's, I want to do this. Here's what the book of Revelation is not. Okay, the book of Revelation is not this doomsday, Armageddon, terror story, horror movie. Okay, that's not what the book of Revelation is. In all honesty, if you have read the book of Revelation, you would see it for what it truly is. It is God's love story to God's church. It is about finding hope in the midst of a very difficult journey. It is about being equipped and encouraged when we face adversity in our life. That's really what the book of Revelation is about. And so this morning we're going to want to look at this first, kind of this first chunk, this first part of the book of Revelation is about God speaking to God's churches. Okay, so, so a couple of weeks ago we celebrated this thing called Easter, right? Everyone remember Easter? We're still in the season of Easter, actually. And what do we celebrate? We celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead, right? That Jesus is alive. That he is risen. That means for the church that Jesus is not absent. That he is not gone. That means that he speaks. He is present. He is alive in his church today. And he speaks through prophets. He speaks and continues to guide and direct us as the church. And in the book of Revelation, that prophet who Jesus speaks to is John of Patmos. And so there are these seven letters to these early churches. And this church that we're looking at from this reading this morning is the church of Laodicea, okay? And it's actually a really cool city. So some 35 years before this letter is written, there's this terrible earthquake, And we know this because of historians. We know this because of writings from people during that time. There was this earthquake, and it destroyed the city, demolished it. And what we know from these historians, what's really interesting, is that these people did not rely on Rome, did not rely on outsiders. Instead, they rebuilt on their own, and they rebuilt really strong. And this was a really cool city, y'all. It had theaters. It was fancy. It was, you know, a very bougie city. Okay, but the problem with this city was with their water supply. See, there's a theme of water. You were waiting for it. You see, they had to get their water from this six-mile aqueduct from a city called Heropolis, okay? 
And so that meant by the time the water got to the city, it was unappetizingly lukewarm. No pun intended. Jesus' message to this community centers around the problem of spiritual indifference, and he uses their own context to really highlight what he was saying through an issue that they already understood all too well. Our reading this morning starts in verse 15. Jesus is saying, I know your deeds. He's saying, I know how you're living. I know what you did this week. And Jesus knows our deeds today as well. And so we have to ask ourselves, if you were to look at your life this week, were you full of spiritual passion for the things of the kingdom of God? Or were you more spiritual and different? Meh. Jesus says to them, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Both serve a purpose, but you're not. He says, so because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. What's Jesus saying? He's saying you are spiritually stale. You are depressingly detached. After what I did for you, what I've called you to do, what I have empowered you with, you don't even seem to care. So the question for us this week is, how are you doing spiritually? I think our technical ministry department has too much free time on their hands. But that's a good one. So we're looking at ways in which Jesus talked about spiritual indifference, and and we see this, this first issue, this first cause of spiritual indifference that Jesus lifts up for us is with this church of Laodicea, and it's this. It's the illusion of self-sufficiency. And this comes just after our reading this morning, picking up in verse 17. This is what Jesus said. He said, You say I am rich. In other words, you've got all that you need. You say I've acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. I've got everything I want. But then Jesus says, You don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You don't realize that you think you have what you need, but really you're missing out on what matters most. I think for me, when I look back at it in college, that was kind of my attitude. You know, I thought, I'm good. I don't need to go to church. I don't need that. You know, I got my iPhone. I had my own car. I could go wherever I wanted. Man, I had a mini fridge in my dorm room full of pudding cups. (laughs) And at the time, I also had Netflix and had just discovered Friday Night Lights, which has like seven seasons and like 45 minutes each episode. So I was set for the entire semester, right? I thought, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. But really, I was missing out on what mattered most. And we do that in our lives. We say we got everything we need. And Jesus is saying, you have material stuff, but you're spiritually void. You're full of things in this world, but you're lacking what truly matters. That your life is full of stuff, but it's empty of meaning. Why is it that we are so drawn to the things of this world And it's the things of this world that never truly satisfy. How you doing? I'm good. I've got what I need. You think you have what you need, but you have no idea. You're blinded. You're full of stuff, but you're spiritually void. It's the illusion of self-sufficiency. The second cause of spiritual indifference that Jesus lifts up comes from the parable of the sower, found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. The second cause is this. It's the distractions of this world. What causes spiritual indifference? We're just simply distracted. Jesus tells this parable about a farmer who was throwing seed out. And some of the seed was starting to take root and to grow. But in Mark chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus says this. He says, but... The worries of this life. 
So all the stuff you have to take care of. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and they do what? And they choke the word, making it unfruitful. I mean, let's, let's call it what it is. This is, this is life, right? This is, this is part of the story. We hear God's word and we become challenged. We become moved, we become prompted, we're stirred up spiritually for something great. And there's no greater example than of Easter Sunday, right? The sanctuary is packed full of people, both in person and online, and we're worshiping and we're praising and we're giving thanks to God for what Christ has done, that he is risen, he is risen indeed. And we're stirred up, we're convicted, the spark is there, but then we go out into the week, and next Sunday rolls around, and the tomb isn't the only thing empty on Sunday. <laughs> right? I get it. Life happens. The kid gets sick. The car breaks down. Someone is in need. We get distracted. The bills are due. There's laundry to be folded. The dishes need cleaned. Life just happens, and it can choke out the word. It's not like we don't care. We just got distracted. We're looking at Jesus, and then all of this stuff happens, right? We get overwhelmed. We, we still kind of love Jesus, but we're just kind of tired right now, and we just want to relax. The two causes of spiritual indifference that Jesus lifts up is self-sufficiency and distractions of this world. From these causes, what I see a lot of in society is this idea of folks who have just a little bit of Jesus, right? Like, just enough to help them feel good about eternity, right? Like, I pray and I was baptized when I was a kid, just enough to say, yeah, I'll go to church every now and again, just enough to make me feel good. You know, I'll, I'll help somebody in need, to make me feel good. Not enough to break our hearts like it breaks God's heart, right? Not enough to grieve over our own sinfulness and inspire us to purpose. No, just, just enough for us to feel better about ourselves, but not enough to be truly changed. As followers of Jesus, there will be times when we feel self-sufficient and do not need God. And there will be times where we are distracted by the things of this world. What then do we do to reignite that fire, that spark? What do you constantly and consistently do to live with passion for Jesus? Because let's be honest, life just happens. So normally at this point in my message, I would tell you to take out your pen and paper and to prepare to take notes, right? I would tell you, here's some, some great ways in which we can overcome spiritual indifference. And you know, I might tell you things like, you should spend time with God's word, right? Because that's never the wrong answer. Or maybe you should, you should talk to God in prayer. Fellowship with God. Don't just talk, but listen. Or maybe you should share your faith. That's actually the one that, that got me to go back to church when I was in college. Somebody from our hometown in Toledo drove down to where I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they told me about this local church, and they said, oh, there's this really cool Episcopal priest. She's got tattoos like you, so you'll like her. <laughs> right? Because that's how that works. There's a network, right? <laughs> Share your faith. Worship God daily. Turn from sin and seek God's forgiveness. And all these things are good. The problem is, if I give you all of these things, you're going to get overwhelmed, and then you're going to not end up doing any of them. And so instead, this morning, what I want to spend the rest of my message talking about is just one simple thing that we can do. So I've known that we're going to get Emerson baptized on this day for some time, and I've been thinking a lot about that. I've been thinking about the fact that for like half a decade now, I've been baptizing and confirming infants, children, and youth. And as a youth pastor, you know, one of the things that just, just breaks my heart is this idea that of all those, those babies and all those youth that I've baptized and confirmed, I see very few of them in the life of the church. 
that for some, this idea that baptism and confirmation is just like this check-the-box faith. It's something that you do because you did it when you were little, but that's not true. That's not the point. Baptism is a sacrament. It is a gift from God, a beautiful gift from God that the entire church is a part of, gets to celebrate in. At confirmation, you then yourself get to live into those beautiful promises that were made for you at the font. And it's at the font where that, that kernel of faith is ignited, where those waters and the waves of baptism wash over you and God's grace abounds. It is call and response. We are all God's beloved children, but at baptism, you claim that for yourself. You say, yes, I am a beloved child of God. That spark of faith that grows from baptism. And so as I've been thinking about it, what is it that I want Emerson to see as she, she grows up? I want her to be able to see her dad and her mom, her grandparents, her godparents, her family. I want her to be able to see their faith, their faithfulness. And so the one simple thing that I want to talk about that we can do to overcome spiritual indifference today is this, is that every single day, do something that requires faith. Every day. One thing. Let the Spirit of God lead you to just do one thing that you could not do on your own. So at the end of the day, as you're getting ready to go to sleep, you can say, what was that one thing that I did today? What was that one thing that ignites that spiritual fire that requires faith? Is it maybe standing up for somebody? Maybe in the office you hear gossip and you choose to stand up for somebody. Maybe you apologize to someone or say I'm sorry or to forgive someone who maybe didn't even ask for forgiveness. Maybe you decide to give and you give boldly and big. Something that really calls you to break your heart for the things that break God's heart. Maybe you, now this is a good Lutheran one, right? Maybe you volunteer to pray out loud at your next small group. Mmm, we can do it, y'all. It's real easy. I promise. Maybe that thing of faith, that one thing of faith, maybe you're going to decide to go to small group this week. Maybe that's your thing. Or maybe if you've been worshiping with us, either, either online or in person for a little while, but you haven't gotten connected yet, maybe that one thing of faith is saying yes to getting connected, to becoming a part of this community, to be all in for the kingdom of God. See, when we're living by faith, what tends to happen is instead of being consumed with what people think about us, we're all of a sudden consumed with what God thinks about us. Instead of rationalizing our sins, what do we do? We confess them before God. Suddenly, we're bold in the Spirit, and people are amazed at our boldness. Suddenly, we're not just turning to God whenever we need Him, but we're turning to Him in every moment of every day because we abide within the vine that strengthens us. And then one day we wake up and we realize we're different. We're changed. That we haven't been conformed to the image of this world, but we've been transformed. Don't worry, Emerson, I'm almost done. <laughs> I promise. We're not lukewarm. We wake up with a purpose. Now believe me when I tell you, it is much easier to live your life just going, meh. But I'll tell you this, it is much better to hurt with a purpose than it is to exist without one. The problem of spiritual indifference is not new to the church. Instead, it's been a problem since the very early church. Jesus talks about this and shows us a better way. He tells his church, I wish you were one or the other. But because you don't really care about what I did for you, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. The one simple way we can overcome spiritual indifference is to do one thing each and every day by faith. One thing. Just one thing. And as we do that, over time, we will see how God has forever changed us. That because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we too become a resurrected people. A changed people. And together we do that each and every day by simply living by faith.
Will you pray with me? Gracious and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, for gathering us, for equipping us as your people, for inviting us into something that is so much greater than ourselves, that will last so much longer than ourselves. We ask, dear God, today that at those times in our lives where, where that fire might need a little spark, that your spirit would guide us and lead us, that you would bring men and women into our lives to walk alongside us, to help us, to grow in our faith, to see that each and every day we have a beautiful opportunity to be a part of your kingdom, to live with purpose, to live on a mission, to do something so great and to share your love and your grace and your mercy with the world. There is no better or no higher calling. And we thank you for that gift of being invited into your mission in the world. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.